Welcome to Worship at Union Church of Pacantico Hills. It's the second Sunday of Easter. Welcome to Union Church Online. If you are on Facebook or YouTube, please leave a comment to let us know that you're here. For those of you on Zoom, please remain muted until the fellowship time which follows the service. If you have celebrations or concerns to share with the congregation, please note them in the chat room or comments section. You are cordially invited to the pastor's coffee hour on Tuesday morning at 8.30 on Zoom, and to Bible study on Wednesday evening at 7 on Zoom. All are invited to join the leaders of Union Church in hearing the results of the Congregation Assessment Tools Survey at a Zoom meeting tomorrow night, April 12th, at 6.30 p.m. For login information, watch your mailbox or contact the church office. Today's music was pre-recorded at Union Church by Richard Coffey, organist and music director, and by soloists Ruth Tedder Di Lorenzo and Marianne Martin Pagello. We worship in the Easter light, for the shadow of death is no match for God's love. Let us join our voices with the disciple Thomas, my Lord and my God. Easter people, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed.
The Spirit of God helps us in our weakness, interceding with sighs too deep for words. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. O Christ, you rose from the depths of suffering, from death itself, to breathe peace upon your disciples. Still, O Lord, we do not trust your promise of peace. Still, O Lord, we do not follow in the way of your love. Forgive us when we fail to be people of resurrection. Forgive us when we fail to recognize your grace. Show us your hands and your feet once more, and teach us to be your body in the world. Friends, hear the good news of God's promise. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. celebrate the presence of your risen word. Enliven our hearts by your Holy Spirit, so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need.
Our second lesson is from the Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter, beginning with the 19th verse. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nail in his hand, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and the hands and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Today's sermon is entitled, Speak Out. After the glorious crescendo of Easter morning, there is a tendency in many churches to experience the ecclesiastical equivalent of an exhausted collapse. Typically, the preacher and the music director take a break from their labors, with associates and assistants stepping in. The wilted flowers are discarded. The hats are put back in boxes and onto the shelf and the imported trumpeters go home. And while it's less conspicuous during these days of virtual gatherings, attendance falls off dramatically from the overcrowding of Easter Sunday. It's not surprising that this Sunday after Easter is known to insiders as Low Sunday. It is also, I think, a very good day to ask a very important question. What was the point of it all? Is there a point? Is Easter, with all its wonderful celebration, an end in itself, or does it lead somewhere? It's a question addressed in the Gospel text this morning. It was Easter evening. After the public execution of Jesus, remember, his closest friends and followers had, gone, had done the prudent thing, gone into hiding. Someone found a safe house in Jerusalem, a room big enough for all of them, a stout door with a strong bolt. They had been there, hiding in that room since Friday afternoon. One of their number is not there as this little post-Easter story begins. There they were, lying low, trying to be inconspicuous, waiting for the Fuhrer surrounding the arrest, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus to settle, 
afraid that if they were seen publicly, they would be identified as his friends, arrested and crucified themselves. Earlier that day, before dawn, a few of the women had ventured out while it was still dark. They had gone to the tomb to anoint his body with spices and ointments, and had returned breathless, almost hysterical, babbling something about the tomb being open, his body gone, angels and earthquakes. Mary claimed to have seen him and talked to him. The ones in the room dismissed it as an idle tale. And then, that evening, something happened that none of them would ever forget. Something that made all the difference in the world. Something that challenged everything they thought they knew about life and death. Suddenly, he was there. Jesus was there. Was it an apparition? Did they imagine it? Jesus came. And what he said was, peace be with you. He said it a second time so they wouldn't miss the point. Peace be with you. And then he told them why he was there, why they were given this post-Easter experience. As the Father has sent me, he said, so I send you. The point here is to get these people out of that room. The point here is to give them enough peace, enough of his spirit, his life and breath, to get them up and moving again. The point here, the, the point of Easter is to get frightened, discouraged men and women who are very much inclined to stay put, to stay in the room as long as necessary, to get them up and moving toward the door, toward the streets of the city, toward their homes and families and communities, toward, that is to say, life in this beautiful world, now suddenly, dramatically, and profoundly different because Jesus has come to them and breathed on them and sent them to speak out. But first, one of the company, Thomas, is missing. Frederick Buechner thinks Thomas just wanted some fresh air, wanted to get away from the heavy oppression of that locked room, that prison. So he's having a cup of coffee or sitting on a park bench somewhere feeding pigeons. I think he's grocery shopping. He's concerned about where the next meal is coming from. He's worried about those people in that locked room and knows they're getting hungry. So I think Thomas, the, the practical, the dependable, the realist, is out buying food. He's known as Doubting Thomas, but I think that's unfair. He's really realistic Thomas, dependable Thomas, and I like the way he thinks. He's not there when Jesus appears and breathes on the disciples and sends them out. When he returns with the food, they, they try to tell him. They're all talking at once, and they're sounding as hysterical and ridiculous as the women had earlier. Unless I see it, see the evidence, see the nail holes in his hands, I'm not believing it. No way. The late Raymond Brown, a, a wonderful New Testament scholar, observed that the Greek here is extraordinarily emphatic. Something like, I'll never believe it. Do you think I'm crazy? I think Thomas is actually the patron saint of rational, skeptical, postmodern people like you and me. I think Thomas simply said what you and I would have said in that situation. Show me. He gets the title Doubting Thomas because we think that doubt is the opposite of faith, that having a religious faith means not having any doubts. Thomas is an important reminder that doubt is not only not incompatible with faith, but is actually normal, natural, a part of faith. 
Unfortunately, in our time, religious faith has all too often come to mean intellectual certainty. For many, Christian faith has come to mean believing certain ideas about God and Jesus to be true. But faith is more a matter of trusting God. Christian faith is more a matter of trusting Jesus Christ, following Jesus Christ, than believing ideas about Jesus Christ. The Episcopal priest and noted preacher Barbara Brown Taylor left the parish ministry some years ago to teach. An interviewer asked her if doubt had played a role. She responded, here's the way I presently live with doubt. Doubt often brings me to poke at what I believe. And when it topples, I realize it was an idol. And so doubt has been a divine gift that has led me deeper into God. Doubt was the catalyst for her that led to a deeper faith in God. Faith as radical trust. Faith for her literally getting up and walking out of the room. Sister Joan Chittister describes her own vocation as author, lecturer, and spiritual director in an autobiography titled Called to Question. She explains how, as a youngster, she always doubted some of the absolute certainties she had been taught. She writes, I was an Irish Catholic child of a Roman Catholic mother and a Presbyterian stepfather. A mixed marriage, they called it euphemistically. What they meant was that we were right and he was wrong. We had the truth and he did not. We would go to heaven. He, well, heaven for him, for them, for Protestants, was at best uncertain. Sad, I know, but true nevertheless. Except that deep down in me, even then, the justice of that statement went begging. Writer Anne Lamott makes the same point in a vignette about a friend who was dying and whose evangelical friends told her that she should be happy to be going with Jesus. This is the type of thing that gives Christians a bad name, Lamont quips, that and the Inquisition. Those same friends had told her that her Jewish nieces weren't going to heaven. Lamont writes, I told her what I believed to be true, that there was not one chance in a million that those nieces wouldn't go to heaven. And if I was wrong, who would ever want to go? I promised that if there was any problem, she and I would refuse to go. We'd organize. Faith is not having all questions answered, all your doubts resolved. Faith is not being paralyzed by your doubts. Faith is not the absence of doubt, but trusting God in spite of your doubt. Faith is not being afraid to, to question, to to doubt. Faith is getting up and leaving the locked room and walking into the future unafraid. At the very heart of our Protestant tradition is the belief that God calls each of us, not just clergy, but every one of us, to live a full and committed life following Jesus Christ. One of the distinctive characteristics of Reformed Christianity is the notion that each of us has a God-given vocation, that God needs committed school teachers and social workers and lawyers, physicians and homemakers, preachers and plumbers and bankers, artists and athletes and accountants. We believe that God calls each of us to a vocation of following Jesus Christ, whatever we are doing with our lives. In the Presbyterian Church, we ordain our lay leaders as well as our clergy. Ordination takes place during worship. 
we gather around our fellow church members and lay hands on their heads and shoulders to emphasize our belief that the hand of God rests on each and every one of us, that the Lord Jesus says to each of us, peace be with you, and as the Father has sent me, so I send you. The point here is to get the friends of Jesus up and moving toward the door, to get them out of that room. For all others, the point here, someone said, is for all others crouched behind bolted doors, dismayed and upset, who have not yet heard or find it hard to believe that death is not the end. The word here to you and me, then, is to get up and get going, to walk out of whatever place we are hiding, fearful, perhaps, worried, perhaps, about the future, anxious about what will become of us, to get up and head to the door and to walk out into the bright light of day, following our Lord Jesus Christ as he goes before us. It was one week later, low Sunday. They are still in the room, and this time Thomas is there. Jesus comes again. Peace be with you, he says. And then to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. And the most, the most amazing thing happens. After all that, Thomas doesn't do it, doesn't touch the evidence his doubts demanded. Instead, he gives a confession of faith and trust, my Lord and my God. Who knows what happened in that room? I keep close at hand something the great Russian novelist Dostoevsky wrote. As far as I am concerned, he said, I look upon myself as a child of the age, a child of unbelief and doubt. It is probable I shall remain so to my dying day. I have been tortured with longing to believe, and so even now, and the yearning grows stronger the more cogent the intellectual difficulties that stand in the way. And yet, God sometimes sends me moments of complete serenity. It is in such moments that I have composed in my mind a profession of faith. So Thomas and the others got up, headed toward the door, walked into the future, and changed the world. All authority and power and dominion to the name that is above all names, Jesus Christ our Lord, now and in the age to come. Amen.
As we pray for the needs of the world this day, please remember especially our elected leaders, first responders and essential workers, children and educators, and Josefina Abreu, Mary T. Johnson, Erica Maniachi, and Byron Weaver. Living God, giver of life, hear us as we pray, saying, Pour out your blessing, O Lord. Send us your spirit of peace. We pray for the church. Let your church be a living sign of the woundedness and healing of Christ. Share the gift of forgiveness and the gospel of reconciliation. Pour out your blessing, O Lord. Send us your spirit of peace. We pray for the earth. Help us to see the scars of death that mark your good creation, and to seek the blessing of life that you offer to all creatures. Pour out your blessing, O Lord. Send us your spirit of peace. We pray for all nations. Show us how good and pleasant it is when people live together in unity, and anoint us with your wisdom so that we may seek the ways of life. Pour out your blessing, O Lord. Send us your spirit of peace. We pray for this community. Give us a vision of the common good, not clinging to our own possessions, but seeking the fullness of life for all, as a testimony to Christ's resurrection. Pour out your blessing, O Lord. Send us your spirit of peace. We pray for loved ones. Be near to those who walk in darkness, and lead us all into Christ's light, so that our fellowship may be true and our joy may be complete. Pour out your blessing, O Lord. Send us your spirit of peace. By the blessing of your spirit, help us to live as we pray so that the world may come to know the gift of life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us be bold to pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods, yet refuses to help a sister or brother in need? Remembering God's great love for the world, let us offer our gifts and our lives to the Lord. If you would like to support the ministry and mission of Union Church, there are several ways to give. You can text UCPH to 77977 on your smartphone and tap the link which will appear. You can give on our website www.ucph.org under the Give tab. Or you can mail your check to Union Church of Pocantico Hills, 555 Bedford Road, Terrytown, New York, 10591. In whatever way you choose to support us, we thank you. Let us pray. Almighty God, receive these gifts that we offer with grateful hearts, and use our lives for the ministry of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
in whose name we pray. Amen. serve our risen Lord. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day, and even unto the life everlasting. Amen. Amen.